you know, when we think about healthy financial habits, I really like this episode because it really helps you understand kind of where you're at financially without kind of uh, looking at one specific area. So if we look at just being healthy in general, you go to the doctors, you might get a high blood cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure, a lot of different metrics you can see to see how healthy you are and what you're doing. So this thing is still relevant with even your financial habits, right? How are you doing? Obviously, we can look at standard things like credit score or even our bank account. I know I have a lot more zeros in front of the numbers than the other ones. However, this is a good way of measuring, but there's a lot of other ways. So first, as always, let's jump into a, an inspirational quote. Never spend your money before you have earned it. I really love this quote because in my personal experience in working in banking, I've seen a lot of people put faith in future them, right? Spending the money before they have earned it. Um, yeah, someday I'll, you know, I'll get a better job. Someday I'll be able to pay this off. You know, they have all these reasons of why it's more important to spend that money now versus being able to have access to it in the future. So we get in the cyclical cycle of always having credit card debt or things on that matter. Um, but again, never spend the money before you've earned it. Um, you know, there's another uh, famous song. Um, it's, it's, it's don't count your chips until you left the table, right? You know, and just always, always know and keep that perspective in mind, whatever way that you want to spend or whatever um, words of wisdom you keep in the back of your mind, keep you on track for today and not, um, you know, putting too much future uh, faith in yourself. So how can I tell if I'm financially fit? Well, you may be wondering whether you're financially fit. Experts say people are financially fit. Share these certain characteristics. And I agree with these as well. Uh, so you earn enough to cover your weekly and monthly expenses. You're comfortable. Maybe your mortgage payment's comfortable. Not saying you have tons extra, but you're, you're hitting your bills, right? Paying your credit card in full. Um, again, you're earning enough to pay everything. You don't have to wait for a bill to come in and pay it after your next pay period. You always have the money in your account to pay it when it's necessary. Uh, a lot of times people are a month ahead of their expenses that way, right? They have um, uh, the next month's expenses ready in their account. So they set up auto pays. They're just kind of functioning. You see these people that are very, you know, have a lot more time to themselves versus having to go through and playing the game of when the money comes in, it goes straight back out. Um, being debt-free or manageable amount of debt. Now, when we say debt-free, a lot of us, we look at responsible debt, right? So student loan debt, mortgage, um, some of those things along those lines are, are still manageable and they're smart debt, right? Something we're going to have for the future, something that's going to be a greater investment in that future time frame. Um, but when we want to be debt-free, it's when that unsecured debt. So when we really get that credit card that uh, even using a home equity in the wrong way. So some, sometimes people get home equities and they start living it, um, you know, vacations and, and things like that. And that's fine. However, have a plan to pay it off. Home equities, in my opinion, are specifically designed for people that are really trying to improve the property and use the equity they gained in that. So just be careful when it, it's manageable amount of debt and being debt free, because again, there's good debt, there's bad debt, and then there's debt that's just not necessary. So feeling confident about your financial future is another one. So we'll see that a lot of times where, um, you know, people are 10 years out from retirement and they haven't even considered saving and they're still at this point, even though the information's out there and the news has been talking about it, that social security will not support um, most of my generation and younger. Um, but even, even still the people, the people that are 10 years out from retirement, you know, social security is not going to be there on all levels. You need to have your own things going. My father just retired and he was only counting on a pension and social security, which is great. But if the pension fails, what's your safety net for that point? There's gonna be a drastic cutback on your living, um, the way you live your life and things like that. So be comfortable and confident about your financial future. Anticipate some kind of market crash. Don't have all your eggs in one basket, have them spread out. Um, you know, a mutual fund, you can make one yourself by just having all these different portfolios and, and the way you diverse it to make it so that if something does happen, it's not affecting everything. Um, the next one is definitely having um, emergency savings. And when we say emergency savings, we're thinking, you know, like the Dave Ramsey style, right? The two to three months of living expenses, cash, not invested, just straight up. If all of a sudden you need $1,500 for a new furnace in your house, do you have that? Can you get that? You know, a lot of us, especially in my situation, I try to save as much as possible into my 401k and investments like that. So if I have much more than a three or $5,000 emergency, I'm going to definitely have to reach into some of those investments or maybe even short term use a credit card until I can withdraw the money from where that money is at getting a higher interest. But again, uh, you know, that two to three months living expenses is what's recommended. And then emergency savings is definitely necessary. That liquid cash is definitely a benefit and it makes your life a lot less stressful just having that cash there. Um, and then saving enough to be retired at a comfortable age, right? Nothing worse than you're thinking retiring at 65 and you go to meet, sit down with your, your investor or your agent and you're 70, and, or sorry, you're, you're 63 and a half about to get social security. And then they tell you that you can't afford to retire. And then you got to work for another five or six years. Don't be in that situation. And it does happen a lot more than people would admit. And then having greater excellent credit. 
right? Um, this is very important because this is something that it does affect people in all ages. Obviously, at a younger age, we understand the impact rate, higher, lower credit score, higher interest rates, we're more of a risk, we're less likely to get approved for the amounts that we need. However, I've seen older people looking down the end of retirement um, where they just haven't used credit in 10 years. They have money, but all of a sudden there comes a need where their money would be not enough to cover it. Let's say they have a, a change in health, right? And all of a sudden they need to install ramps or modify their house in a way. Well, they come and apply for an equity and they don't have a credit score. No, it's not something that's going to be for sure a long-term turn away, but it still causes a headache or a hiccup in the process of doing it. So having greater excellent credit is great until the age that you die. And honestly, you should be using, utilizing credit in some way or another, regardless, because you just don't know the future. Again, you're putting too much faith in future you if at some point you decide to live cash, which I understand the responsible side of it, but there's definitely things that are controlled costs that you could roll on a credit card that would just automatically pay it off so you don't have to do anything besides the you know, 10, 15 minutes setup of getting it, getting it going. So just definitely having excellent credit is, is another one. So these are the, the six major um, you know, the characteristics that we see when someone is financially fit. If you fall you know, in four of these, great, fix the other two. Uh, if you find that you're not actually being able to um, get the mark on a couple of these, then definitely sit down with your personal banker, be it here, be it somewhere else, and, and start working today. It's not going to fix itself over time. It's something that you're going to have to put a little bit of time in each day. Much like learning a language, we say 20 minutes. Spend 20 minutes a day with your personal finances, and it will be more front of mind, more front burner, and easier for you to manage. So one of the best ones that we see people are financially fed is living within their means. And I know it's easier said than done, because living through means is your expenses should not be more than your net income. However, sometimes we have seasonal expenses. Sometimes we have things that pop up, you know, emergencies, right? Those would be considered outside the means within a certain point. But this is why we have savings and, and, and recording everything you spend is, is part of that, because a lot of people, when they do set up their budgets, what they run into is they're, they're saying like, oh, yeah, for my utilities, I pay like $200 a month. But in reality, if you took all 12 months, of their utilities, they're actually paying three or four hundred. So they're underestimating how much they're actually spending. And this is why they're running to the situation. So it's important. I actually recommend in this type of situation, if you're really trying to see and testing your healthy financial habits is to do everything via your debit card or credit card because it's gonna track everything. Cash has a tendency to slip through the cracks. And when we're trying to be recording everything, every dollar, um, we wanna make sure that it's, it's tracked that way. And don't make it harder on yourself trying to keep a journal or a book, use technology for its benefits there. And adding up all your subtraction or all your expenses and subtracting your income should put you at a certain level. Um, and that's known as your DTI. And we'll cover here that in a minute. But, but really it's, if you aren't living within your means, examine your expenses more closely and try to figure out why. Take the time to do it. A lot of times, again, we're just like, oh, I'll have some time someday. And then it's a cycle that never ends, right? You just keep on pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. And you really need to just say, this is enough. I'm going to do this for myself. No one's going to come down and hold your hand and do it. You got to just do it yourself. But I know you can. So try it out. Take out all your expenses. Make sure your needs and wants balance the way that you should. And a lot of times, and even in my old days in banking, you have two highlighters. You just go through your statements. Once you've spent all your transactions, through a credit or debit card, and it's all noted there, go through in your needs and wants, and then add them up. Play with the numbers. See if there's anything as a, as a fun game for the 90, last 90 days. See if there's anything you can tighten up. So spending wisely is another one. There are a lot, there are many tactics you can use to determine how much you should be spending. Uh, one that we like a lot is the 50, 30, 20 rule. And it looks a lot like this if you break it down. Now at Arbor's website under the learn tab, there is um, quite a few calculators. This is the this this is the 5030 budgeting tool. So this will tell you kind of where you fell off the spectrum. Um, and if I had um, you know filled it out, this is kind of what it breaks it down. But I will I will tell you a lot of people that are, are not really sure, or not sure they can do it. Once they start seeing these visual images or these these breakdowns of their budgets, because there's one even on our on our learn tab that uh, you can put in every single exp expenditure that you have in the month. And it'll break it down in all the subcategories. So the circle looks very broken down. But then it, what stands out is where you're spending the majority of your money. Um, generally for myself, it's spending out, eating out. I like eating out at restaurants. Sometimes after a long day of work, the last thing I want to do is cook some food and clean up a kitchen. So it's definitely a struggle. But I do fall within the spectrums of the 50, 30, 20. So it is still spending wisely. Now, <laughs> freeing up the funds to pay, access, to pay expenses is something that we can definitely do. Um, and this might need that we need to... <laughs> We need to borrow money to pay the bills, right? Um, if we're getting hit with fees and it's getting swamped, we might need to have that to stop that cycle. Now, I would definitely not say by any means I'm saying go to a payday advance place. That would definitely, so many other options before that. It's sometimes an easy option when people feel they're against the wall and that's why they get into that. 
uh, but there are a lot of options like um, like Green Path here that we partner with to do um, debt settling or debt consolidation. So there's definitely a lot of different ways, but reducing your expenses is going to be what you have to do. And expenses are really going to be on the want side first. And hopefully maybe after that, the needs go down, right? Because you need to pay your minimum credit card balance. However, as it goes down, it gets less. So we're going to reduce expenses, but it's going to most likely be on our wants. Uh, we're going to examine the earning potential, right? Am I making as much money? Do I have extra time to work now? You know, a lot of times it's a work-life balance that everybody goes through. Um, as you're, if you have young kids or a young animal and you got to spend more time at home, that's going to be something that's a real setback or real drawback. Um, but if your kids are older, if you don't have kids and you have extra time and it's the choice between sitting on the couch or making a little extra money, um, I read somewhere that like 33% of Americans have a second source of income. Um, and, and then don't do yourself a disservice. Do try to get that paid, pay taxes on it. Um, I know some people do little side jobs here and there. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you, if you consistently have a secondary job, make sure you're claiming the income because that's going to help you in the long run when you apply for stuff, just because you'll mess with your DTI. Uh, and getting a second source, sell some stuff, right? A lot of times people are like, oh, I have all this capital, but it's also tangible capital or tangible assets. Let's sell it. Let's move that money. Um, I know a little bit like, well, it's only a little bit here and there. We'll put it in a side jar, put it in a side account until it adds up and then pay it off. Um, I do this thing quite often. I walk through my house and say, what can I sell? Not because I'm trying to pay off so many bills, but just try not to hold on to excess stuff and let it build up because eventually it's not gonna be worth anything. So avoiding too much debt is one of the other ones. So if you have too much debt, you're not alone. In fact, Americans have, most Americans do have debt. It goes between healthy debt and bad debt. Um, one strategy by financial institutions is assess whether you have too much debt is the debt to income ratio. And this is what we we're talking about earlier. So if I have a monthly income of $1,800, and let's just say my bills were $788 a month, that'd be at 43.78% DTI. Well, is that good or bad? Well, here's what we think. So if you're less than 10%, you're optimal. Uh, if you're safe, you're 10 to 15, questionable, and then poor, and then at risk. So if I was at 43.78, I would be at risk. Now, we run into a lot of people that are put in this threshold because, okay, let's say I was rocking at 5 or 10% DTI. Well, I want to buy a house. Well, most mortgage companies are only going to go up to a certain DTI, right? So with what you already have to pay, with what you're proposed to pay with the new house, where's they going to put you at? So you do see some people that sit at this high dollar amount. And that's not necessarily bad through all points of your life. If it's at a point where you're making higher income and you have more liquid cash or more cash flows coming in, but as you get closer to retirement, you want this, and it's actually for a safe measure, to be less than 10% when you hit retirement. You don't want to have a mortgage payment. You don't want to have a car payment. Really, you don't want to get any, any obligation that's going to be anything that you can't pay off within 36 months or three years. Um, and that's what they recommend is when it comes down to DTI. So there will be some points. This is one of those things that's like, okay, it's understandable that it's high. Just monitor it. But if you just got a brand new home and you have two young kids and whatever's going on in your life, life's moving fast, you're just traveling, maybe you just have higher debt, it's going to be something that's understandable. But just know this takes you out of getting approved for other stuff because when you apply for something else, this is the number you're going to run. And every company has a max they'll go to, right? Let's just say 45% is the max that a mortgage company will go to. Well, if you're already at 43% before the mortgage payment, they're not really going to have any room to get a, get a home. And there's a lot of people that walk in the doors that figure this out the hard way. So watch the DTI, try to keep it as low as possible. Manage existing debt is also a big one. Um, there's no doubt about it. It takes a lot and it's burdens for years on us, but minimizing debt as much as possible is important for our financial well-being. So try downsizing, try working with the creditors. A lot of times it's, it's funny to me when people are like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I had too much debt. Well, have you, you know, like student loans, even that. But it's like, have you tried reaching out to the creditor before it's due? No, I just didn't think that it's like, you know, once you, once the due date passes, there's a different process the company or business goes through in obtaining that money that you owe them beforehand. It's a different process. And it's also a lot friendlier student loans. If you call them up the day before, you're like, Oh, I can't make my payment. They, they might be able to give you forbearance for a couple months. They might be able to lower your payment credit card companies. Sometimes they'll even let you skip a payment. You might have to pay interest for that month, or maybe even a small fee to do that. But the majority of your payment could be wiped out, but it's only before the fact, if you call after that ship has sailed. So work with creditors beforehand. If it's after, still work with them because if you can keep it from going to collections, um, that'll help your credit score. Might just drag out before they report, but it might give you enough time to clean up the debt before it actually gets noted on your credit report. And then obviously consolidate your debt, right? If you can consolidate it, do it. If you can roll to one credit card, some people call it the balance transfer game. If you can move a balance every every so, certain period of time and pay a one-time fee, but then have no percent, you know, no APR on top of that, and you can pay it down by chunks. 
definitely consider that. So consolidating your debt's huge. This is where a lot of people also use a home equity, which is not what I recommend, but if you can save yourself money, cash flows each month, and then turn around and pay more of it down, well, that's a smart thing to do. And then obviously, like I said in the beginning, be realistic with future you, right? So saving for retirement, they say by 30, you should have uh, um, an annual, sorry, half of your annual income, and then by 40, twice that. You know, if we're living the paycheck by paycheck area, uh, Social Security is not something, again, that we're going to be able to count on. So it's the rest up for you. So set up that retirement account. Make sure that you take advantage of the free money your employer is going to give you. Match out employers. Some places, you know, with, with nowadays, with the way that employment works, it's, this is an area where I'm seeing huge growth. Um, at a previous employer, if you put six in, they'd give you 7%. Um, you know, even here I'm at now, it's very nice. So match what they're going to give you for free and take advantage of that because that's essentially free money and it's pre-tax. Um, start investing early. If it's if you're in your 40s, your 50s, it's still not too late. Promise anything you have set aside, no person in the financial realm will tell you that's a bad idea. Just be smart with what you're doing it and don't lock it up for a time that's not convenient for you. This is why I recommend involving a professional investment executive uh, and just having run through. Trust me, it doesn't matter how much money you do or don't have. They will work with you. They want to make sure you're set up. Um, and so don't think that it's intimidating that matter. But if you don't talk to them, you're just going to hurt yourself when you go to retire. Uh, and then I always call it the forced savings plan. The reason I like employer matching and HSAs and 529s and those other nice accounts that are pre-tax is by the time the money hits your account, it's already gone. Um, there's a lot of people that think they live in the paycheck to paycheck realm on this. But if you're already saving 10, 15 percent, 20 percent of your income into a savings account or a saving vehicle like that, and you're spending the rest of your income once it comes in after you pay your expenses, that's not really living paycheck to paycheck. Yes, you spend your, your, your free money, but it's not, again, living the true paycheck to paycheck, which is spending everything, not saving for the future. So recommend checking out the four savings plan. It's not really a thing. It's a word I made up. But again, it comes out before you even get your, your, uh, your little mitts on it. Uh, so the key points, I know we're wrapping up here. Uh, don't spend more than you earn. Keep track of your expenses. People think they spend way less than they do. And this is the, usually the opener of like, this is why we want to use your credit card and debit card to do it, because it really does bring truth to the way that you're actually spending. Manage the debt you have. Don't let it go sour. Keep it, keep it managed. Uh, you know, call, call on your student loans. Ask for lower interest rates from your credit card companies. Um, I'm not saying it happens all the time, but you'd be surprised nowadays, especially pre or sorry, post-COVID, um, the help that's out there for you to help you pay down those debts better. Save for emergencies because we don't know when they're happening. Uh, and save for the future now. Doesn't matter when you're going to retire. Doesn't matter what you think you're going to do in the rest of your life. Save because there's no one out there anywhere that would tell you it's a bad idea. Um, thank you so much. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Was there any questions for anybody?